And hyperscale data center designs are leveraging simple hardware to dramatically reduce energy consumption and also deploy simple nodes to replace single points of failure. Here at TIA 2016 Network of the Future Conference, TIA Now will look into how we are changing such things as data center vertical, vertical integration and moving towards purpose-built vertical designs. Here with us today is Michael Menefee. He's Chief Rocket Scientist at Opus 3 and Steve Hassel, President of Data Center Solutions at Emerson Network Power. And gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be Thank here. You. Thank you for being here. I love your title, by the way. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great title. <laughs> I'm laughing. I just love the title. <laughs> it's a great title. <laughs> Again, Steve and Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, I want to get both of your perspectives right off the bat about your definition of a hyperscale data center. And Steve, I'll start with you. Well, we deal with data centers from all sides. So when we hear the term hyperscale, you got to think about scale both going wide as well as then up in, uh, in capacity. So a hyperscale data center, usually, as you said in the intro, has got lots and lots of nodes, which give you that out piece, which allow that computing power to be up very high. They also typically run a standard type of an application. You, you normally look at this as an abstraction layer, software going all the way across that allows you to do things like search or Facebook or the types of, the types of services you use every day. Michael? Yeah, the analogy that I often use is really, you know, it's like a city. You build the city out so far, but you run out of land, so now you have to start building up. So then the question is, how much can you fit in that data center that, you know, you have that footprint already? Uh, how many kilowatts per rack? How much computing power can you actually put together? And the most important part, how does it all communicate? And so hyperscale actually starts to look like what we used to call high performance computing or supercomputers or that sort of thing, but now sort of commoditized and actually available for general purpose applications. Uh, similar thing with the, the abstraction layer. We've seen a lot of activity in messaging buses and in other things to get away from you know, less efficient protocols and easier ways to share memory, you know, information like RDMA and that sort of thing. And so I think it's really kind of a mix of both the physical definition of how much stuff do you have under the roof and also how do you architect it and how do you communicate. I'd agree with that. So uh, Steve, are hyper, hyperscale data centers leveraging simple hardware and can you be a little more specific maybe about blade approaches? Um, what you're, the trend that we tend to see is, is the hyperscale data centers are moving towards a simpler infrastructure and that may not mean a different type of an infrastructure. They may use blades, they may use the traditional 1U pizza box type servers. Uh, but what you see is, is they're eliminating things that they don't need specifically to execute that application we were talking about. So a normal server would, is a general purpose machine could be used for a lot of different types of things. A hyperscale uh, client knows exactly what they're trying to do and anything that isn't serving that purpose is waste. So they tend to get out of it, they tend to get rid of it. Sometimes that means going to a third party provider called a white box provider. Uh, sometimes it means just scaling down different things off of, off of commercial type devices themselves. But simple makes it easier to manage, which is where the hyperscale guys really make their money. So I know Emerson Network Power is really uh, dedicated and invested in, in uh, reducing energy consumption when it comes to hyperscale data centers. Can you give us a little bit of little background on that? Uh, the trend towards data centers, both for the hyperscale, all the way to the enterprise, all the way down to smaller uh, data centers at the edge are all about saving energy. And that means understanding where you have capacity, how it's being used, and, uh, and then how to optimize it. We say it's about seeing what's going on making better decisions about how to balance loads across and better utilize your assets, and then be able to take action uh, to do that. Now at a hyperscale, things are happening very large, very fast, so that means you need to have a combination of controls as well as in software helping them manage across that entire environment. And that's part of what we do at Emerson Network Power. And I think, I think we're also going to see, you know, we've with the communication networks that are now making some of this hyperscale things possible, are actually starting to rival what used to be, we'd call a front side bus from a processor through memory. And so once you start doing that, now you actually start looking at not just a data center as a rack full of servers and individual systems, but actually an integrated system all by itself. And now you're actually managing not just power for, okay, well, I've got all my CPUs and they use this much power and I've got my disks and they use this much power, but what needs to be on at any given time, right? And just like we have cell phones that turn parts of themselves off 
could we actually start targeting parts of the data center off when they're not in use or when they're sitting around waiting for queries at non-peak times, that sort of thing. No, that's exactly right. When I talk about this a lot, about, uh, about how to orchestrate all this together, the analogy I use is like the autonomic nervous system in your body. Uh, if you think about it, your body is always reacting to what's going on, temperature, uh, you know, light with your pupils dilating and everything else. You aren't consciously managing all of that. Your conscious brain is, is dealing with the workload that, uh, you know, that, that your data center is really operating. You want all the rest of that, uh, the, the moderation of the buses and things like you were talking about, you want that to happen in the background automatically so that the data center moves and breathes kind of as the loads move around and in the end result what you're getting is is the same output with a lot less input which is energy. Right. Michael, I mentioned in the introduction about uh, um, deploying many simple nodes to replace a single point of failure. Tell me what that means and give me an example. Well, yeah, so if you start looking at this just like we were talking about, well, you, always, you almost have all these nodes here that traditionally you'd have to individually manage and okay well I've got an image for my virtualized desktop and you know this sort of thing. Now all of a sudden we've got instead of a thousand nodes, a hundred thousand nodes, there's no way a person can actually go manage all of those. So it's not just simplicity, it's also uniformity. Mm -hmm. And by putting all of these nodes out there, now we can manage them as a single unit instead of individually and then actually be able to accelerate the performance when we start you know, creating software and that sort of thing and deploying it, they can all talk and work and be tested much, much simpler and much faster. By virtualizing, in, in, uh, what the software does is it virtualizes uh, the activity across all these different nodes and the idea there is in the past when you would design systems, it was all about making sure that the one box never went down. As you distribute the load across a lot of different devices, if you lose one, you lose a little bit of performance, but fundamentally the entire application is still up and operating. And that gets you the type of scale that you need, so any individual machine that goes down or has a problem doesn't affect the whole. That's really where the magic of the virtualization and this entire hyperscale type of environment works best. And I think we're actually moving to a different footprint here a little bit too. Uh, there's a, a great story about Netflix and when they were first starting out, they built a thing called Chaos Monkey that would literally go into their system and randomly kill nodes, mm. one purpose. And mm. it was basically to design a system that expected an anticipated failure instead of reacting to it. Well, all of a sudden now, if one box goes down in the old days, well, you had to turn everything off and recover it. and. I spent entirely too many nights sitting around pulling stuff off backup tapes, right? Mm. Well, now you don't have to do that. It's all live, it's all up there, and you have an additional redundant hardware capacity in your system to then have something step in and take over. And we're seeing that in our largest customers now where they may have an individual server fail, and rather than some, somebody to replace it, it isn't worth it. So they'll wait until there are multiple servers in a particular rack or row go down, then move the entire infrastructure out at the same point in time upgrade, replace it, because no individual component is that necessary. I also mentioned, Steve, in the introduction, um, changing data center vertical integration. Again, define that for me and give me an example, please. Well, vertical integration is really about combining. We, it's convergence, and you can do it on the IT sense when you look at your compute, your storage, and your networking, all operating as a single unit. We also like to take that a step further and include the physical infrastructure. So the power as well as the thermal management and then usually you contain it as well. It's becoming a very popular piece because again you're adding chunks of capacity, uh, very large chunks and you want to be able to do it rapidly. So in our case, uh, this part of converged infrastructure may be as large as an entire data center hall. Uh, that we will that we will deliver, and it's because the capacity of these hyperscale clients are moving at such a pace. They're putting out literally megawatts of capacity in a single in a single move. And in order to do that, you need to look at everything as a single converged unit. In a lot of ways, we've seen some of this already with virtual desktop integration. Right? We've seen in scientific computing using GPUs to accelerate mathematical performance. Well, now all of a sudden we're doing the unthinkable and hosting CAD desktops and data centers and delivering them over these high bandwidth connections. So we're seeing very highly integrated virtual hardware coming down. We're seeing Intel with more and more cores and ARM with more and more cores on a single chip. Now all of a sudden it's, well, what if we start delivering those, like you said, 
as single rack units, and every, everything is, okay, this is integrated for a particular application and optimized for a particular workload, just like we used to do with supercomputing. It's almost the commoditization of it. Now we're hearing, uh, and this is uh, somewhat of a topic in, um, in, a, in a previous panel, that the next big battleground in server design is Fabric Wars. I'd like both of you to sort of t talk about that. What is Fabric Wars? Well, Fabric Wars are something that, in, in my experience, have actually been with us for a long time. And that is how fast and how far can you extend a simple interface to connect your applications that are running on the CPUs. So, you know, we saw the Cray actually adopt COTS hardware for one of the first times with Hypertransport when that came out. We obviously had a way to move from box to box with an external connection just on the front side bus. We're going to see more and more of those designs come out where it's, okay, you now have, instead of going from memory to CPU to network, it's just one shot and everything looks to your application like it's already available and already there. Now, in terms of achieving that, with Cisco and, and what others have done with the converged Ethernet networking, we're going to actually start to see which standard becomes popular and which standard actually makes it from the chip all the way out to the wire, all the way out to the network, all the way to the data center, and maybe beyond. It's really about consistency, uh, which is that abstraction piece, and, uh, and, and then speed. That's what you're trying to do so that the application doesn't have to be constrained with any particular hardware, any particular storage medium or anything else. And, and it does come down to a competing protocol because somebody's going to win that war, as you referred to. I think the other war is really going to be the war of 19 inches, right? We've, we've put things in 19 inch racks for so long. Now we're actually starting to see blade servers or things that are even smaller than blade servers uh, actually start going into a rack. Well, now it's not just the fabric that's actually hooking your machines up, but literally the way you physically install them and, and manage them in the system. So, you know, are we going to start seeing more backplane designs like we've seen in, in higher end, you know, real time systems? Are we going to see standards for blade servers finally? You know, some of these other things where you can deliver infrastructure without the actual compute or storage capability and then just buy modules to plug them in. One of the uh, architectures we designed for, for a client uh, was designed around an Intel microserver where literally hundreds and hundreds of servers that were in place all operating on the exact type of a backplane uh, that, that we just talked about. Much more efficient than having to, to connect the individual components in place but requires you to give a little bit more forethought into how you want that entire rack to operate together, again, kind of as a blended ecosystem. Well, thank you so much. You, you really define hyperscale data centers. You talked about um, sort of uh, the evolution of that as, as we sit here, but really also the future of that. So you sort of answered my questions without me asking. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> Made my job easy. I uh, appreciate your time and being in our TI now, or the Dell TI now studio. And uh, hopefully we'll speak again. All right. Well, thank right. you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Michael and Steve. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us at TIA 2016 Network of the Future from the Dell TINL studio. For more information, or for more coverage, rather, please visit TINL.org. So long. Yes.